رحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you, Doctor, for this introduction. I don't know. I am not able to start my video. There might be an issue with the host, so I will talk to you without the video. First of all, it's my pleasure to be with you in this conference, talking about a very important topic: thrombosis and systemic lupus erythematosus. And before starting, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me. Now, when we talk about SLE, SLE, as we all know, it's an autoimmune disease with a variable, diverse presentations. The diagnosis is often complex, require both clinical and laboratory criteria. The prevalence of SLE is about 20 to 150 cases per 100,000, so it's not a rare disease. It's actually the second most common rheumatological disorders in, in our practice. And it's affecting the people between 15 to 44, and majority of our patients are young uh, individuals. And this is very important when we talk about the thrombosis, which are affecting their quality of the life. The incidence of a thrombosis in lupus patients is 26.8, and it can go up to 52% per thousand patients per year, according to the disease duration and the disease activity. And we have to know that the most common cause of death in lupus patients are either active disease or thrombosis with equal percentage 26.5 and then infection 25%. It depends on the time of the mortality in the first 10 years more toward the active disease and in the late 10 years more toward the thrombosis. However, thrombosis is one of the major causes of death in our patients. Looking to that, we should think about thrombosis and what are the risk factors for thrombosis. It's clearly demonstrated that SLE by itself is an independent risk factor for both arterial and venous thrombosis. But unfortunately, the thromboembolytic events are not included in the classification criteria for SLE, which is useful to some degree to be used in diagnosis. If we look to the most recent published criteria for lupus, 20, uh, 2019 ULAR and ACR classification criteria, where they require A and A to be positive, and then we need 10 points at least to classify the patient to have lupus. As you see, here, there is nothing about thrombosis, whether it's arterial and venous. Although, as we said earlier, it's one of the major causes of death in such patients. There are several risk factors for thrombosis and lupus. And it cannot be explained by only traditional risk factors, which is known to all of us, the obesity, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, diabetes, and so on. But there are factors that's related to the SLE itself. The inflammatory risk factors, such as high inflammatory uh, markers, mainly CRB, high homocysteine, and other pro-inflammatory cytokines. Other factors relate to the disease itself, and mainly the disease activity has been associated with increased risk of thrombosis, and particularly the lupus nephritis is clearly a risk, carries a high risk factor for thrombosis. So let us explore these risk factors which need to be addressed when we are having a lupus patients. First of all is the active disease. And the inflammation, we know it reduced the fibrolytic activity by upregulation of the production of the plasminogen activator, activator inhibitor. And also the anticoagulant effect of protein C pathway is impaired in lupus patients due to the downregulation of thrombomodulin. The lupus nephritis, as I said earlier, it's considered one of the risk independent risk factors for thrombosis, both arterial and venous. This is a busy slide, but just to draw your attention, several pro-inflammatory cytokines play a major role in thrombosis and atherosclerosis. Some of them like TNF-alpha, ICAM, VCAM, and interferon-alpha activation. And several inflammatory cytokines also play a role in, infl in, in induction of thrombosis. This is a large study they look to the uh, risk of venous thrombosis, mainly DVT and PE, in a CLE and compared to non lupus patients. And as the diagram is clear, the risk of DVT is much higher in lupus patients as compared to non lupus in general population. 
The same finding was demonstrated with regard to pulmonary embolism. And it's very clear that the risk of PE is significantly higher in lupus patients as compared to the general population. So knowing that, let us look to the risk factor and the predictors for arterial thrombosis and venous thrombosis in patients with lupus. And this study, they compared patients with glomerular nephritis, either related to the SLE or glomerular nephritis, non-SLE related. And as you see here, SLE was found to be a significant risk factor for thrombosis. And as again, the other factors like dyslipidemia and renal impairment is considered a risk factor for thrombosis, either in lupus or non-lupus glomerular nephritis patients. The other risk factor for thrombosis in this patient's group is the antiphospholipid antibodies. These anti-antibodies are included in the classification criteria. The lupus anticoagulant present in around one third of the patient and anticardiolipin antibodies in around 40% of patients of SLE. We published our study from KFMC and we found that the antiphospholipid antibody in our patients, it's around one third. 29% to 30% of our pain, they have the positive antiphospholipid antibodies. One third of the patients with lupus anticoagulant had at least one thromboembolytic event. But again, even if they have a negative lupus anticoagulant or anticardiolipid antibody negative, the SLE patient, they developed the thrombosis. And the risk of a thrombosis in such scenario, it's 10 to 18 percent. So it's clearly that the presence of antiphospholipid antibodies doubled at least or tripled the, the risk of thrombosis in SLE patients. And the pathophysiology behind that, the antiphospholipid antibody induced the platelet activation. It interfered with the coagulation inhibitors and therefore initiated the formation process of a thrombus. These antibodies are associated with both arterial and venous thrombosis, and therefore presence of these antibodies are considered risk factor for myocardial infarction and CVA. This just to remind all of us the risk, the criteria, the classification criteria for antiphospholipid syndrome, which require clinical as well as the laboratory criteria. And the clinical could be vascular thrombosis or pregnancy-related morbidities. And it's very important to highlight two important points when we consider ABS diagnosis. First of all, the, the positivity has to be confirmed on two occasions, at least two, 12, 12 weeks apart, because these antibodies might be positive in response to the infection, or many medications can cause positive antibodies. And therefore, it has to be confirmed on two occasions, 12 weeks apart. And the second important point is the titer. We have to look to the titer. They have to be moderate to high titer. The low titer might not be associated with high significant risk of a thrombosis. Whenever we talk about ABS, we have to keep in our mind CAPS or catastrophic ABS, which is in summary, the quick progression of a thrombotic events within a week in the patients who are positive antiphospholipid antibodies with a clear indication of presence of a thrombosis documented by either imaging or biopsy. The other risk factor for thrombosis in our patients is the drug and mainly corticosteroid therapies. We know the steroids are the cornerstone therapies for treatment of lupus, any manifestation starting from arthritis up to the CNS lupus manifestations. But these drugs have a lot in the numerous of metabolic side effects. And if you look to the statement, a person who is using 30 milligram corticosteroid, a SLE patient, has a 60% greater two years cardiovascular events than a lupus patient with the same disease activity, but he is not using corticosteroid. So steroid is significantly associated with increased risk of cardiovascular diseases and thrombotic events. And therefore we should, or we have actually, to monitor steroid, we have to minimize the steroid as much as possible, as quick as possible, and we have to practice using steroid sparing agents from day one 
diagnosing of SLE. So the corticosteroids have been associated with thrombosis, probably mediated by endothelial damage and accelerated the atherosclerosis. However, there are good drugs that are used for treatment of SLE, which is anti-malaria drugs, mainly plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine. And this agent has anti-thrombotic effect, anti-inflammatory effect, anti-hyperlipidemic effect, anti-hyperglycemic effect, anti-platelet effect, and therefore we are always saying plaquenil, hydroxychloroquine is a cornerstone of treatment of SLE, has to be initiated in all the patients unless it's contraindicated, it's safe during pregnancy and lactation, so please do not stop hydroxychloroquine unless it's contraindicated or the pain developed a significant side effect. This drug, PLAC, TLA, toll-like receptor 7 and 9, and also inhibit the interfer interferon alpha production, which play a major uh, role in pathogenesis of SLE. There are several risk factors also present in the lupus patient, like high level of homocysteine. And hyperhemocysteinemia is detected in around 15% of lupus patients. Hyperlipidemia or dyslipidemia is not uncommon in lupus patients. And those patients are having elevated triglyceride, LDL, and decreased HDL. And what's specific for a SLA patient, they have altered HDL function. So in addition to the low level of HDL, the function of HDL is impaired in such patients. So statin therapy are associated with reduced the mortality and cardiovascular events in lupus patients with hyperlipidemia. But using statin in absence of dyslipidemia, it's still debated and it's still questionable. Vitamin D, low vitamin D correlated with venous as well as the arterial thrombotic events in ABS patients. And when we look to the insufficiency, it occurred up to 70% of ABS patients. Deficiency, it's up to 50% of uh, ABS patients, they have vitamin D deficiency. And vitamin D, we know it inhibits the TLR4, MYD88 signaling, TF expression, endothelial activation, and therefore the inflammation. And the low vitamin D level were associated with complement activation, placental insufficiency, and preeclampsia. So vitamin D is a very important uh, factor to be considered when we are dealing with lupus patients and ABS patients. So when we talk about thrombosis in SLE, after exploring the risk factor for it, around 13% of pain will develop cardiovascular events, including ischemic heart disease, CVA, peripheral vascular disease, or even mortality due to the thrombotic events. Retinal vein thrombosis occurs more frequent in patients with SLE, and we have, I have at least two to three patients with retinal vein thrombosis, and the underlying disease is only SLE. So we have to keep an eye for thrombosis in, in lupus patients. In this study, they look to the venous and arterial thrombosis in the SLE patient, and they try to find the risk factor for thrombosis. And as you see here, for arterial thrombosis and venous thrombosis, presence of at least two traditional factors for cardiovascular disease will, risk, will increase the risk of a thrombosis. Old age will increase the risk more towards the arterial thrombosis. Smoking and hypertension more towards the arterial thrombosis. But immobilization and surgery will increase more venous thrombotic events than um, uh, arterial thrombosis. Now, over the next 15 minutes, I'm going to touch the treatment of thrombosis in SLE patients. Now, we all talk about the DUAX, which is the new era in treatment of thrombosis. And the direct oral anticoagulant, as compared to the warfarin, they have fixed dose with a predictable anticoagulant effects. There is no need for routine and monitoring. And they have a fewer drug interactions, not like warfarin, which has a very long list of drug interactions. So they are appealing uh, for thrombotic ABS patients who are generally require lifelong anticoagulation. So let us see whether we could use these agents in our patients or not. Now, RAPS 
trial which exploring the rivaroxaban in antiphospholipid syndrome they use rivaroxaban 20 mg versus the standard intensity warfarin and they recruited 116 patients with first VTE or recurrent while on subtherapeutic or no anticoagulation and patients with a previous ABS related arterial thrombosis were excluded this is very important they, they excluded the arterial thrombosis Unfortunately, this study did not meet the primary endpoint, which is the change in the endogenous thrombine potential for rivaroxaban. But there were no thrombotic events during the seven months of follow-up in this trial. More trial comes after TRAPS, which is evaluating rivaroxaban in thrombotic ABS. They use 20 milligram OD or 15 milligram if there is a renal impairment. And they compare it versus the uh, warfarin with target to INR 2.5. 120 triple ABL uh, positive thrombotic ABS included. And unfortunately, this trial was terminated prematurely because more thrombotic uh, events occurred <clears throat> and it happened in seven out of 59 patients. And these thrombotic events were more arterial four structs and three MI as compared to none on warfarin therapy. Another trial compared rivaroxaban versus vitamin K antagonist in ABS. And this is designed as non-inferiority trial. They recruited 190 patients with thrombotic ABS. 60% they are triple positive. And they compare rivaroxaban versus vitamin K antagonist with target INR 2 to 3 or three to four in those with recurrent thrombosis. And again, the recurrent thrombosis rate was 3.9 in rifaroxaban as compared to 2.1 in vitamin K antagonist. And struck occurs more in patients receiving rifaroxaban than those receiving vitamin K antagonist. And actually there was no struck in such patients. So clearly in ABS, whether it's with or without SLE, with arterial thrombosis, rivaroxaban up to this moment should not be used in a patient with arterial thrombosis. <clears throat> Another trial and post hoc analysis, they suggest increased risk of thrombosis in rivaroxaban treated patients who are having a previous arterial thrombosis, levito resimosia, and ABS-related cardiac valvular disease. And we know the levido resimosa is considered a risk factor for arterial thrombosis. So put in mind, those who are at risk for arterial thrombosis should not be treated with rivaroxaban at this moment. Now what's about the other Blox agent? The astro-ABS, they tested the abexaban for the secondary prevention of thrombosis in ABS. And they used abexaban 2.5 milligram twice daily versus INR223 in the thrombotic ABS. And unfortunately, this study was modified twice. They increased, they pushed up the dose of uh, abexaban to be 5 milligram twice daily instead of 2.5. And they modify, second time, they modify the protocol and they excluded the patients with a prior arterial thrombosis and they require MRI of the brain prior to the randomization to rule out an evidence of stroke. So let us look to the systemic literatures and meta-analysis to warp the DWAX in a patient with ABS with or without SLE. When we look to this meta-analysis literature review, it's clearly indicating that the risk of recurrent thrombosis is 11%. And they found the risk factor, those with triple positive ABLA, with previous thrombotic events, with arterial or uh, venous uh, events, and number four, those who need immunosuppressive therapy. And this is very important for us when we talk about SLE, because almost all SLE patients require immunosuppressive therapies. So at this moment, we are not recommending using uh, DUAX in the patients with SLE. Another meta-analysis, they found that the risk factor for recurrent thrombosis by using DWACs in patients who are having triple positive ABL 
and a higher number of clinical criteria of ABS, prior thrombosis while on vitamin K antagonist, antagonist and this, those patients with arterial or small vessel thrombosis, which all the literature confirm what we know nowadays that those with arterial thrombosis should not be exposed to these agents. This is a most recent meta-analysis and literature review that's published a few months ago. And they tested all the studies that published with regard to the duax versus warfarin or vitamin K antagonist. And as you see, clearly the thrombosis was higher in a patient who were exposed to these agents. But when we look to the safety measures, the major bleeding and mortality, there was no statistical significant differences between vitamin K antagonist and the duax. So, in my view, I don't think the safety is the issue to get toward the mortality and the bleeding, but the recurrent thrombotic events is a major issue when we are using such agents in, in our patients' population. So what's about the DUAX and stroke? Do DUAX offer sufficient protection against recurrent thrombosis when high intensity anticoagulation is recommended? Till this study, the rice pass, which is the RCT, they use the high intensity rifoxaban, 15 milligram, twice daily, versus warfarin. It's now recruiting the patient. Till we get the answer from this study, it's not recommended to use it in a patient with <clears throat> arterial thrombosis. That most of the studies about the ABS. So what's about SLE? There is only a few scattered case reports about SLE who given the drugs. And I found this case series, they reported three patients, two of them are SLE. They have been, uh, thrombo uh, they have been developing the thrombosis and they exposed to <coughs> dabagetran. After almost two years, all of them developed another thrombotic events. The first patient was given the Begitran because of struck, and then he developed the digital ulcer. And the second one, DVT, and then she developed the CVA, which again indicating a failure of these agents in, in our patients group. When we look to the most recent recommendations from the 16th International Congress on ABS, the, DUAC, the recommendation that DUAX should be avoided in ABS patient with arterial thrombosis. And the first line should be vitamin K antagonist. DUAX should be avoided in ABS patient with small vessel thrombosis. And the first line should be vitamin K antagonist. <clears throat> if you have a patient with a single or double positive ABLA positivity, after the first episode of VTE, you could continue the DUAX till you are sure the pain is having persistent ABLA positivity. And then if it's persistently positive, single or double, you should discuss with your patient the pros and cons about using such agents. If your patient is triple positive, and you started the DUAC, please switch your patient to the vitamin K antagonist or warfarin when you got the result of that confirmed the positivity. <clears throat> and the DUAC should not be used in ABS patient with recurrent thrombosis while in vitamin K. Now, when we talk about the arterial thrombosis and the primary prevention, always we raise questions about the aspirin. And this clearly indicates the aspirin does not confirm the benefit when it's given for the primary prophylaxis in antiphospholipid syndrome in absence of SLE. However, in the presence of SLE, the scenario is different. When we look to the meta-analysis of the low-dose aspirin in ABS, when they lumped the observational studies as well as the RCT, they came in a conclusion that the low-dose aspirin might reduce the risk of thrombosis in asymptomatic antiphospholipid positive individuals and patients with SLE. A meta-analysis of five cohort studies, they found the protective result of the aspirin is mainly toward the arterial, but not the venous. So it's a clearly there is a contradicting uh, evidence about using the aspirin 
in, as primary prophylaxis. And in this condition, we should think about the pros and cons, the side effect, the advantage and disadvantage. So let us here explain what we want to say to our patients. The annual incidence of a thrombosis in ABL positive individuals is very low, it's zero to 2.8%. While the risk of bleeding is high, and the major GI bleeding relates to the low dose aspirin increased by 58%, and also increased the risk of hemorrhagic stroke. So we have to keep it in our mind, those who are positive in absence of SLE, I wouldn't recommend giving the aspirin as primary prophylaxis. But in patients with SLE, we know as we explore over the last 20 minutes, the SLE per se is considered the risk factor for both venous and arterial thrombosis. I would recommend to give the patient with SLE low dose aspirin who is having positive antiphospholipid antibodies. Now, the last Congress about the antiphospholipid syndrome, they recommended that to give the patient uh, aspirin if they have a persistent lupus anticoagulant, those with a double or triple positive, or those with a very high antiphospholipid uh, titer. And in this condition, you might consider low dose aspirin as primary prevention. If we look to the ULAB, from a rheumatology point of view, for management of antiphospholipid antibody is still the recommendation is to use the vitamin K antagonist and they just recommend at all, they do not recommend use rivaroxaban in a patient with a triple positive and a patient with arterial thrombosis. Hydroxychloroquine, it's a very important to prescribe it in all patients because as I said earlier, it has a lot of effect and, and, and reduction of thrombosis. And this study, it's clearly indicated those who are given black quinil have a significantly lower thrombosis rate as compared to those who were not given hydroxychloroquine. Statin will reduce all the pro-inflammatory biomarkers that play a role in thrombosis, but prescribing statin in a patient in absence of this lipidemia is not recommended, and we do not have enough data to support prescribing statin in absence of this lipidemia. Vitamin D, although we know and we explain the deficiency rule um, in, in triggering thrombosis, there is no enough uh, evidence to support supplementation of vitamin D to reduce the atherosclerosis and thrombosis. Rituximab, there is a sporadic report about successful use of uh, rituximab for treatment of uh, thrombotic events in SLE antiphospholipid patients who had recurrent thrombosis, the benefit of rituximab, and many report about using rituximab in ABS in none criteria, which is usually do not respond to the anticoagulation. So the rituximab might have a role in treatment of some ABL related non criteria manifestations, maybe have a role in refractory caps and a patient with refractory uh, thrombosis in SLA patients. Two minutes, Dr. Ibrahim. Okay. When we talk about pilimumab, which is the basal depleting agent, again, there is no clear data to be used in, 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 in SLA with thrombotic events. There are only two report cases and all of them about none uh, criteria uh, that relate to the antiphospholipid. So there are no data to support using of pilimumab in such conditions. Complement inhib inhibition, which is play a major role in, in, in triggering the thrombosis in, in, uh, in antiphospholipid, the eculizumab has been approved for HUS, for example, and has been used in a patient with CAPS. So we might consider it in CAPS with refractory microangiopathic diseases. Traditional risk factor, we have to pay an attention to it in our patients. We have to trigger the diabetes and treat it uh, accordingly. We have to look to the, the uh, hyperlipidemia and control it. We should advise the patient to stop smoking, reduce their body weight, and control the blood pressure. So in conclusion, uh, the, about the DUAX, when you have arterial thrombosis, is not recommended by all the authorities. Those with venous thrombosis, bottom line, is not recommended if you have triple positive. If you have a single positive or double positive, you should 
think about the pros and cons and discuss with your patients the guidelines recommended vitamin K antagonists, but you could use such agents in these conditions. SLE patients usually they have renal disease, so if you decide to use drugs, you should think about the dose modification in such conditions. What's about the duration of anticoagulation? The answer is not known, but usually we recommend it forever. And the last thing, there is insufficient evidence to make strong recommendation about the low-dose aspirin for uh, secondary and primary prevention in a patient with ABLA positive. And, and SLE is recommended. The traditional risk factor should be monitored. The biological agents are very promising, but there is no enough evidence to recommend using it on a regular basis. Thank you very much.